Um, actually, what I want to do is talk about the hindrances. Um, but a couple of things before that. Um, there, as I said, it's difficult teaching this retreat. There's so much I want to communicate and so much it feels important to communicate because you're all in different places with different needs. Um, I mentioned the walking practice yesterday and uh, Derek's just mentioned metta and it's who is doing metta as their basic practice? Anyone? Great. Okay. So when you walk, do you, are you comfortable walking with the metta practice? Like you know how to do that? Yeah? Okay. Um, what I want to say, I guess, is I will talk about metta tomorrow, but wha again, what I want to introduce as is, is doing metta with the energy body awareness, which means that I might have phrases, I might have visualizations, whatever, but I've actually got this whole space and I never lose that. And I'm sensitive to that. I'll talk more about this tomorrow. So that when I walk up and down, I'm walking up and down in that kind of awareness with all the metta and whatever, however I'm doing the, the metta, yeah? Um, actually, that's all I want to say for now, and then we'll talk about, I'll talk about metta tomorrow. Is that okay? Um, second thing, very briefly, uh, I was very rushed um, in the latter part of, of yesterday's talk, so I just want to make sure that something was clear. It might have been clear anyway, and I might not need to say this, but um, when I was talking about the you know, why are we doing jhana practice and how we conceive of the reasons for doing jhana practice and, and therefore what we emphasize. I didn't, I don't want to sort of replace uh, other emphases or, or what other teachers might emphasize, sort of simplifying or laser beam or unwavering mind or, you know, all that. I don't want to replace those reasons, more add to them, okay? So all those emphases can get, are important, they're emphasis can get emphasized at different times, but I just wanted to want very much to add something that's not often talked about that to me seems really, really important. This, these qualities of sensitivity, attunement, refinement, uh, et, et cetera. Yeah, that, um, so it's more to add that to the possib possible reasons we're doing this and uh, the e possible emphases and, and actually then to allow those to be um, more prominent or even the most prominent uh, emphases and reasons. So if, if anyone, I didn't mean to say that's all, you know, we're getting rid of all that. It's more just a question of emphasis. So, Okay, what I want to talk about, as I said, is the hindrances. Um, now, there's, there's a few things here. One is that, um, you know, sometimes Sometimes uh, in the suttas, it, it, it's almost, not quite a definition, but it's almost like with the abandoning of the hindrances, there arises the first jhana. So it's almost like part of the definition of the jhana is the absence of the hindrances. It doesn't say with the unwavering concentration on this or that. It says with the abandoning of the hindrances. So that's quite interesting and it's quite important. Again, it has implications. How am I thinking about what I'm doing here? But what I want, part of what I want to say about them is, uh, so it could sound like, okay, so working with the hindrances is something that applies pre-jhana. And it certainly does, of course. It applies uh, right from day one of anyone's meditation uh, practice. Um, but not just then. Once the jhanas, and even all eight jhanas, are ex maybe accessible and regular uh, visitors or explorations, etc. Even once all that is kind of up and running and going and wonderful, um, the hindrances will still arise at times. Absolutely. What I also want to add, uh, and what's much less commonly sort of talked about and acknowledged, is that they arise, they can arise very subtly. Subtle versions of them can arise in a jhana as well. Now I use that word in in a loose way, kind of avoiding the silliness of this extra sharp definition of what is and what isn't a jhana. And the point is, again, about subtlety, that even within, uh, within a jhana, there can be subtle hindrances around. And there's a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya where the Buddha's teaching actually super, super advanced meditators. They're doing all this whizzy stuff with um, psychic powers and all that stuff, and he's still talking to him about what subtle hindrances arise in that depth of samadhi. 
So we have to have uh, this idea of the hindrances, as I said earlier, they're part of the deal. They're part of the deal when certainly jhana feels like a million miles away. Um, they're part of the deal once we've already had a lot of experience in the jhanas, they'll be coming and going. And they're, and they're actually part of the deal in a subtle way, even in a jhana, therefore part of the work, part of the play, part of the whole. So again, when I say jhana practice, I mean, I mean including the hindrances and, 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 and all that. So first thing I want to do, I want to say something about insight in relation to the hindrances, but first thing I want to do is rattle through pretty quickly because it's probably, a lot of this is probably um, familiar to you. I want to rattle through um, some antidotes to the hindrances. Um, so wi first thing to say before that is uh, antidote is, is something we, uh, you know, you apply something with a certain goal in mind. I want to get rid of something. I want to you know, an antidote to an illness or whatever is, let's hope to get rid of this illness. Um, so, you know, there is, let's say, ways of practicing insight meditation at times when a hindrance comes up and the view is, it's fine, it's just here, I just watch it. I do the same with a hindrance as I do with a non-hindrance or anything else. I'm just watching it, it's not better or worse, and I'm, I'm just, it's okay. When you're doing jhana practice, that's not the attitude. We want antidotes and we want to work against the hindrances okay and this is primarily even in even the satipatthana sutta this is actually the instruction of the buddha talking about f what feeds the hindrances and what starves the hindrances and we're clearly really interested in what starves the hindrances so there's a slight kind of tilting over the years of modern sort of mindfulness teaching but anyway it's still a valid way of working at times but in jhana in samadhi practice no we've got a different a different relationship a different attitude again um watch out for the inertia watch out for the habit if you have a habit of just oh it's just a hindrance i'll just sit it out i'll just watch it it's okay it's fine um we want to shake up that inertia a little bit galvanize it they are going to come. There is no way uh, they're not going to come. If you come into an interview and you report to me, you know that you you just didn't have any hindrances. I just say you're not paying attention. Um, it's because at least the subtle ones are going to come, no matter how much practice you've done. Um, and usually, as I'll explain later, um, also the not so subtle ones. So rattling off through the antidotes. I the two most common hindrances are probably, they're given usually in a certain order, but let's start with the two most common, which are sloth and torpor and restlessness, actually restlessness and worry. So I'm just going to throw out a bunch, and if you think of one that I've forgotten that's actually really helpful, then just shout it out. So we'll put them all in a pot for, people, for everyone to use. So sloth and torpor, the getting sleepy is the extreme, the, the mind, the head nodding like that. But uh, like all of these, it has a range. So just dullness, fogginess, sleepiness, etc. lack of energy. Um, expanding the awareness to the whole body. There's, there's a reason why I just say that over and over and over. It's so, so, so important. It will affect the mind. It's impossible to, if, if you're really expanding the, the awareness and really filling it with attention, actually quite hard to be, to be nodding. There's something about it that's the opposite movement. So expanding the awareness of the whole body and really feeling it again and again and again. Um, the in-breath has, has been as I've sort of mentioned as part of a couple of the guided meditations. The in-breath is naturally energizing. The out-breath is naturally relaxing. So that if I want, if I need more energy, a bit more attention to the in-breath and a bit more attention to the energization of the in-breath is going gonna, is gonna to energize things. A long breath or longer breath or very long breath will also energize. It will energize the body, just, you know, you can think of oxygen or whatever, but if you think in energy terms, it's just there's more energy there, and that will energize the mind. So long breath, move to a long breath, if you're working with the breath, of course. If you're working, let's say, with metta, then... Again, what, what's going to help? Could it be that going back in the categories to the easiest person might actually lighten things up, bring a bit of brightness just because the meta comes and it's easiest? Or might it be that going to the difficult person because they're difficult and the challenge of it keeps you awake? 
Or might it be that uh, expanding to all beings, just partly because of the, the spatial expansion, which I'll come back to in a second. So the question is, do I need to shift categories if I'm doing metta? Um, and which way? And there's not like it's always going to be this one that's going to help. So I have to have that willingness to respond and experiment. Uh, more pegs, okay? So we talked about pegs uh, in the counting, right? So bringing back those pegs really gives the mind, keeps it busy, gives it something to focus on. It literally keeps it up from sagging, okay? So make those... Uh, what's the what? The German word for pegs, goes to. Oh, verangeln. Yeah, so like a, or like a, yeah, so with the, with the, n with the n numbers in the counting, they're like pegs. With the meta practice, if you're using phrases, the phrases are like pegs. So, you know, what, what can often be really helpful in the meta practice, so, so let's say your first two phrases are, may you be, um, may you be happy, may you be peaceful. So using a may you be happy, may you be peaceful. Actually, if the mind needs a bit more, m more pegs, if it needs more energy, more, if it's getting lost, some may you be happy, may you be happy, may you be peaceful, may you be peaceful. So each one twice. First one, I'm not quite there. The second one, I'm a bit more there. So just small things like this, but they make a lot. They can make a lot of difference. Um, you can also just imagine. Uh, actually, I'd say your whole body. Uh, filled with a bright white light, just like the sun. Okay, really, really useful. Again, when the mind gets tired, it gets dark, foggy. You can also uh, open up the awareness very, very wide. So much wider than the energy body size, which is just a little bit bigger than the physical body. You can open it up to the size of this room. It's a lovely, huge room, or even wider to the, the sky outside, etc. When we get tired, the mind shrinks. It's actually what we do when we curl up and go to sleep, is we, the mind pulls in on itself, in a way. And so opening up that awareness, open your eyes, uh, open up the awareness to have a sense of the whole room, you're, you're kind of moving the mind, encouraging it in the opposite direction that it does when it, when it contracts uh, as it falls asleep, you know, or, or g gets tired like that. Tired mind is, is a small mind. Uh, you can also um, sometimes just sweep through the body, uh, paying attention to whatever sensations you feel there. So, and again, experiment. Is it more helpful right now with uh, this hindrance right now to sweep really fast? And sometimes it is when we're tired. Just move the attention quite quickly. Uh, maybe it's more helpful going up, or maybe down, or maybe both. Or maybe it might be helpful really slowly, really getting into the sensation. So y again, you have to experiment. So those are some antidotes for sloth and torpor. Okay, we really want to use these. Um, with restlessness, um <coughs> it's actually restlessness and worry, which refers to worry about um, ethical misdeeds that I'm worried I've done, or someone's going to find out this or that. Um, but we'll leave that apart. Uh, we'll leave that aside for now. Um, but a lot of them are, uh, interestingly, quite uh, similar. So more pegs can really help. Um, uh, if you're working with the breath, the long breath tends to really help with restlessness. Um, or it could be like we just did. It's like there's a way you find a uh, just a way of breathing or a way of construing the breath that just feels soothing. Like maybe there's a place on your back and it's almost just like someone just, the breath and the sense of it comes metaphorically like, like someone just soothingly stroking your back and that, and that addresses the restlessness, it soothes the restlessness. So again, we can shape the breath um, with our imagination, the, bre the breath energy, and that can have a real effect on our energy, of course. Uh, again, expanding the awareness to the whole body, so it's useful for opposite hindrances, if you like. And again, the sweeping uh, of the attention can be really helpful when there's restlessness. 
one particular thing, if there's a lot of restlessness that is not so much mental but physical, uh, in other words, it's not pr a lot of thought proliferation, but it's just the body feels restless and the mind won't settle down with that, then what can be really helpful, again, is a really large awareness, as large as you can just open it out, but within that, you have a job to do. And the job is, you let go of your primary base object and you become aware of the sensations of restlessness, the actual prickly kind of feelings that arise and pass in the body, that pin, you know, that sort of thing, in this big awareness, and your job is completely allowing them, and there'll be moment to moment, arising, passing, unpleasant, and a completely welcoming them. So actually, technically, what we're doing then is we're switching to what I would call it's, it's a particular insight way of looking. But if you stay with that for a while, actually, for reasons I'll talk about later, it can settle the whole thing down. The whole system settles down because we're in a, then a very different relationship with the restlessness. So when restless comes up, we have aversion to the restlessness. It's unpleasant, the very sense of the restlessness. And that aversion to the restlessness feeds the whole thing. So when you go wide like that, and you come into a mode of completely allowing, completely welcoming, we're almost by definition quietening the aversion. We're, we're, in a non we're practicing a non-aversive relationship. Do you, you understand? And it's that and, and the space that will really, really, really help you. Stick with it, stick with it again and again. Actually, if you just do, I remember playing with this years ago in the home, restless, restless, sitting about doing that, actually then ending up sitting for three hours because that very practice just allowed everything to calm really, really, really down. So it, these, all these things, that they're, they're quite powerful if we, if we find the right way to work with them. Okay, the sense desire as a hindrance. Um, third one, uh, it's usually listed first, but I'll put it the first, first one. Um, let's talk about one particular kind of sense desire, sexual desire. Okay, there's desire for someone or wh whoever it is. Um, you know, you can go and take a cold shower or, or whatever, but um, I, I, I'd just like to offer this as, as, as a real possibility, especially as one develops more and many all experienced meditators. So oftentimes what happens is there's sexual desire and it goes to an image of having sexual contact in some kind of way, have this person or whatever it is. Uh, that's the bit that's not so helpful for samadhi, okay? Um, but the desire itself and the energy, uh, there's a way of working with it. So for instance, okay, here's, here's the desire, it's gone to the image already. Is it possible to kind of feel the energy of sexual arousal? So I've got desire, I've got image in the probably not imaginal sense, but an image there, and I've got sexual energy or arousal, right? You could of course, they're related. We could say you've got three things. Of those three, if I can uh, focus on and open to, actually, and feel the energy, not getting, so most people, the image comes, the desire comes up, and then the image comes up, and then the, and then the feeling, and I'm lost in the image. I'm lost in chasing this sexual fantasy. I'm embroiled in it. If I can kind of focus more on the energy and actually open to it, mean allow that actual energy in the space of the energy body, uh, actually it feels good if it's not too tight. I open to it and I enjoy it. It's actually quite close to PT. It's quite close to the kind of good feeling. And oftentimes when people first experience PT, they say, oh, it's like an orgasm, or it's like a, it doesn't have to be that intense, but um, there's, there's a similarity there. So what you're really doing is approaching this thing more energetically, feeling it, opening to it, and kind of riding it in a way that allows it to shape into something that is a more pure energy, which is actually very conducive and helpful to where we're going, or similar to where we're going anyway. Does that make sense? So I wouldn't necessarily obviously give that to complete beginners, but you guys have had a lot of experience. So if that's the kind of desire coming up, that's good. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a way of, of working with it. It can be very similar to PT if I can kind of filter things out and emphasize and open in the right way. Um, what about desire for food? Anyone got any suggestions? Sitting here and I can't think of anything but lunch or tea. Does that come up for anyone? 
Okay, not a problem. Um, ill will and aversion. I split this into two, this hindrance. Um, ill will means actually I'm getting really upset with someone here and so much so that I wish them harm. Okay. Um, meta, obviously. You, you switch, even if you're if it's really strong, you know, just switch from the, if breath is your base practice, just switch to metta. I need, I need to deal with this ill will. I absolutely because when that's there, it's not going to help, okay? Um, it's really going to get in the way. But there's another possibility within that, which is when I um, have ill will towards someone or aversion towards someone, I just don't like them, and uh, the mind is in that kind of uh, nasty state, however, however gross or subtle. Actually, what I can do then, so the first thing I think, oh, I'll give meta to that person, which is great, that might really help. But there's a second possibility, which is actually bring the attention back to myself without trying to change the ill will or the how terrible this person is or those kinds of thoughts and feelings. Bring the attention back to myself and actually notice and feel the dukkha of that ill will here. It's in my heart. There's a taste in my mouth. It's, in a, it's a flavor in my energy body and my consciousness. It's dukkha. It's painful. So I'm not trying to change the will. I just come back and I, and I feel what's happening. Don't judge. Just, just what does it feel like? Oh, it's dukkha. And feel the pain of it. I just have to let my consciousness touch the, the pain there. If I'm doing that, if I'm just letting it touch it, then what can happen is when I touch that pain, when I come into contact, it turns into compassion for myself. Okay, self-compassion. You think, yeah, but my problem's with the other person. It doesn't matter. Once there's self-compassion, there's compassion. It's an, a new energy in the system, and it will soften everything. So my self-compassion starts changing my relationship with this other person. Do you understand? So that, that's really, really useful as well. And then what can also happen, and what you will, I'm sure, notice happening over the course of the retreat, is that we get aversive at certain noises. The heating, or the birds, in the, the rooks, which are a lot quieter than they used to be, say, 10 or 15 years ago for some reason. Um, and it's like, oh, those crows are so loud, or whatever it is. And but I'm trying to meditate, and they're bothering me. Um, or this person is just every time they get up there, their bones creak, like my bones creak, or whatever. Um, something, or they're breathing, or you know, um, aversion at noise, which could include aversion at a person or another sentient being or whatever it is. I ha this is gonna, it's gonna be really common. Okay, I have to remember the big picture, the goal. Where am I going in practice? I'm certainly not going towards more aversion. I'm going towards less aversion. Um, that's what I want. It's not even jhana as my primary goal. It's less aversion, less kilesa, freedom from the defilements. Um, we want to get to, just to remind myself, where do I want? I want to get to a place where there's less aversion. I'm less bothered by noise. It's, uh, it, I'm more open, there's more love, etc. So again, what does that imply about how I should practice the jhanas? and what, what kind of way I'm holding a, a, and, and my view of the whole thing. Is it possible? Can I find a way of practicing the jhanas um, that uh, is not so bothered, that kind of includes sounds and coming and going and noises? Uh, not bothered, but not throwing out the baby with the bathwater and say, oh, it doesn't, I don't need to make an effort then. So some attitude, view, or stance here that's really, really possible. Sometimes what you can actually do is actually, again, deliberately let the primary object go and open up more to sound and a sense of really including that. And that very, again, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the opposite thing of aversion. I'm opening to sound and including it. And I'm not saying, oh, that's other than what I'm trying to do. I'm opening to sound and including it. And then that ch starts changing the way I feel about the sound and inside. And then within that, keeping that openness, actually, then I can reintroduce the the, um, the the primary object, but, I, but I've got it in a much bigger space and a much bigger attitude, a much bigger orientation. You know, technically, we'll get to this when we talk about the second jhana. But actually, technically, if you, if in any moment you could just quite significantly 
turn down any aversion in the mind, you, you would come very close to the second jhana. Sukha would arise, happiness would arise. With a lot of practice, well, actually, maybe, again, this is one of those things, just try. I say, well, just try. Somebody say, okay, just turn down the aversion. You say, what do you mean turn down? I don't know how to do that. Just try. Just try to turn down the aversion, because turning down the aversion can then just directly give rise to happiness, uh, give rise to sukkha. Okay, last one, um, doubt. So doubt, we can doubt the teacher, we can doubt the teachings, and we can doubt ourselves. There's probably lots of other stuff, but those are the three sort of common ones. Um, so what's the difference between questioning and doubt? Um, doubt often involves an absence of questioning, in fact, or an absence of letting questions um, blossom and grow into into kind of uh, uh, you know something that's actually an inquiry that's actually helpful. So doubt tends to paralyze. We get stuck in a kind of confusion or this and that. We're not actually questioning anything. We're just we're just the mind is just shuttling back and forth or going round in a circle. So sometimes underneath all that, there's actually a question or two or three that n- that need to get uh, clarified and formulated and perhaps ask to oneself or to a teacher. But we haven't let the question form yet, and, and we're just stuck in this kind of unclear shuttling back and forth. So is there a question there? Once we've got a question, it's no longer paralyzing. We can, for even formulating it clearly will help, we'll feel, we'll, we'll feel unparalyzed, and then formulating it and asking and engaging will, will be really helpful. But doubt paralyzes, and so just one thing to bear in mind is, timing here. When, when am I going to wrestle with this either question or doubt? Outside of the meditation is the answer. In other words, yeah, there's something I'm really not sure about. I'm confused. I have a question. I can't proceed until I have an answer. Just This is my meditation time, so I'm just going to put that aside. But I promise you, mind, that I will get to this question and I will think about it. I'll ponder it. I'll inquire. I'll ask something later. So you make a deal with the mind. It's like, yeah, we're going to get to this. I'm not ignoring it but it happens outside of the formal <laughs> formal practice, yeah? Okay, how many people have heard of the practice of exchanging the happiness of self and other? A few of you, okay. Um, there's, again, it's, it's a huge, huge practice, infinite possibilities. I think there's quite a large section about it in uh, the book I wrote, Seeing the Free, so at some point you can visit that. I want to say it's a really, really beautiful practice. It's, it's one of the most gorgeous explorations you can do as a meditator, full of creative possibilities and um, lovely, luscious possibilities of transformation. In a nutshell, here I am, p- pretty miserable from some hindrance attack or whatever, and I say to myself, you know what? I'll take this. I will take this. Because somewhere, someone else, maybe someone I know, maybe someone I don't know and will never know, someone, somewhere else, um, correspondingly, by magic, I'm taking their dukkha, and they can have the happiness. So again, what technically you could say, well, what am I doing there? I'm instead of the automatic natural aversion to the hindrances, I'm actually saying, come. Come, I take this, but it has heart in it. It has this. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take this suffering right now. I'm opening myself to suffer for the sake of um, the release from suffering of someone else, somewhere. Yeah. So it's a kind of, you could say, a magical thinking. It, it doesn't matter. I, I using your imagination, whatever. There's all kinds of variations on that with emptiness and stuff. But that's the nutshell of it. Is that It's a very beautiful thing. Often what happens with the hindrances around is there's no heart as well. Everything's got squeezed um, miserable and there's no heart. So one one possibility is bringing the heart in in that that very beautiful way. And that's doing, as I say, so you could do that with physical discomfort as well. I can take this pain right now. I will take this pain right now. I'm willing to take this pain right for the sake of someone else's uh, ease someone else's well-being. Okay, like I said, I'm moving pretty quickly. Is this okay? Pace not too not too fast. Yeah. 
<coughs> and like I said, we have to get clear that the hindrances, um, we have to get clear a, a few things about the hindrances. One is that they that there are subtle hindrances as well. So everyone's used to really gross hindrances and it's generally what gets what we get taught about um, when you first hear about the hindrances on insight retreats and stuff like that. But they also uh, manifest very, very subtly. And as I said, there's a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya where Buddha's talking and he's talking about subtle, and he lists all these subtle hindrances. So things like elation and inertia, um, fear, um, s- slight over-efforting, slight under efforting very very slight he's talking about um desire if it's if it's in in not handled well um perception of multiplicity and then you, you know just in a way paying too much awareness of different things there's a, there's a whole list there um but the point is They, there's a whole there's a whole range of subtlety and in a way where there's always something to play with and work with and experiment with something that uh, can be tweaked a little bit of course there's sometimes in jhana practice where all that goes and we're not actually aware of any hindrances and that's fine you don't have to go looking for them at that point you just get into the enjoyment of it as you get more into the territory of a jhana then you start to realize the kind of more subtle hindrances that might be there or possibly be, be there at times that at first you don't realize so it's not that we're always looking, we're not at all always looking for hindrances with jhana practice. We're actually inclining more to what's pleasant and easeful and, and enjoying, yeah? But, but it does, they will come up subtly. Are you okay for a bit more? Is it, you got the energy? Yeah. Let me point out something else that I want to come back to on the retreat and actually emphasize quite a lot. That, And it's something that I think is gets clearer through jhana practice than through insight and mindfulness practice. And it's a kind of very common micro-negativity of the mind. So you might be sitting there um, with a very nice energy body. You might be sitting there with PT, etc., or whatever it is. And you might be quite used to it by that point, but it's still pretty nice. Uh, most people would give their right arms for what you're experiencing at that moment. But you've experienced this kind of thing before, and the other day it was better than it was today. <laughs> and I know it can be a bit better. And in this kind of very subtle way, the mind is inclining towards what's wrong, what's not quite as good as it should be. What's c- so part of that is okay. It's part of the, the shaping. It's like when, again, the potter with the clay, the the clay on the on the wheel wet of course what's wrong it's not a bit so i'm 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 kind of pressing it but when it has a flavor of when it has that negative we're talking this can get incredibly subtle okay it's just half cup half full half empty thing but on a, on a really really subtle level it's just this moment there's something in the way i'm seeing this and relating to this actually really lovely thing and I'm somehow spinning it in the, in the, in the with a negative, I'm seeing it through a negative lens, you understand? This is incredibly common, and it's, it's what we might call like a really um, deep, deep, almost base level kilesa, defilement of aversion in the mind. The, so this, this, this you'll notice more and more as things go on, and it's something that's actually really important to address and work with. The really good news is that we notice this um, much more in, you'd think you notice it more in mindfulness and insight practice, you actually notice it much more in jhana practice. And you'll get much closer to it and you'll see it working at a much, much subtle level and you'll be able to do something about it. And r- what I want to say right now is, and I'll repeat this and other things, we, we just notice it, expect it, notice it, find the pleasure, get into enjoying it, find what's nice, get into enjoying it. So we just, we just make a micro movement. We're talking about a micro subtle defilement. We just make a micro shift of relationship and attitude. Yeah? But in a way, we could construe that as a subtle hindrance. Absolutely. Okay, and again, in, in, in terms of subtle hindrances, there's two forms uh, called sinking and drifting. I don't know where these words come from. I, I don't know if they're originally in the Buddha. I've never come across them in the Buddha, but I picked them up from um, 
think it was Kamala Sheila, I can't remember, but they're around now in Dharma culture. So drifting and sinking, what does that mean? I, drifting is a sort of subtle version of restlessness. And really what it means is the mind uh, is still alive, you're still mindful, you're not nowhere near like jumping out of your skin or anything like that, or obsessed with worrying or that kind of thing. The mind is, um, you know, it's present, it's everything's good, it's, it's kind of with its object, but there's just a bit more tendency for it to drift off the object. Um, or sometimes it manifests as just a bit more sort of thoughts and images in the mind and a little bit more tendency of the mind to get pulled off into them. So we're to again, we're talking about something quite subtle. And sinking is the subtle version of sloth and torpor. Again, nowhere near nodding or falling asleep or anything like that. It's just a little bit of dullness comes in, a little bit of sort of, it's not quite so present, so alive, so bright, so sharp. Um, these are interesting hindrances because oftentimes what they're most related to is effort levels. Again, we're back to this question, uh, this issue of effort levels and the fact that I cannot, I cannot avoid that issue. I cannot avoid that parameter of practice. Um, a little, as you get deeper and deeper in, in samadhi, a tiny bit of, ec of too much effort, just a little bit too much effort, a little bit too less effort, makes proportionately more of a difference and more of an impact. So in other words, Again, the deeper we go, the more sensitive the whole system is, and a bit too much effort, a bit less effort, actually kind of gets in the way or causes, pro has more of an effect at a deeper level, yeah? So with, the, with these subtle hindrances, sinking and drifting, um, one of the things that's really worth paying attention to is just, just the effort levels and seeing, um, can I, what is it then, like what we were saying earlier today, what is it to just to back off the intensity or perhaps to move from in my directionality, perhaps from more of a probing to more of a receiving. Or, so in other words, uh, what I wanted to say is either sinking or both, both sinking and drifting can arise from either too much effort, very slightly, or too little effort, paradoxically sounding. We don't know. What do you have to do? You have to just get in there and play, play with that play with that subtle effort, bit more, bit less, bit more intense, bit less intense, bit more probing, bit more receiving, bit more delicate, you know, whatever it is. And um, sometimes one of the ways I like to think about this is, for example, with the drifting, why is there more thought? Why does the mind go on? Some, we're squeezing the mind too tight and in a completely uh, incommensurate image. It's a bit like squeezing a banana skin and the banana comes shooting out. <laughs> um, maybe that's not the greatest analogy. Um, but again, going back to what we said before, the ho whole body can reveal the effort. Ho even just the size of the attention can also affect this. So there's lots of things to try, but, but one main point to take is the spectrum. We're really talking about a spec when we're talking about hindrances, we're really talking about a spectrum. Despite what the Buddha said is with the abandonment of the hindrance, with seclusion from the hindrances arises the first jhana. Yes, that's true. And at another level, we're talking about a whole spectrum here that's not going to go away in one form or another. Sometimes even in jhana, you can get if we again in in inverted, you know, in using that word in in a slightly loose way. You can be, here's, here's the happiness, here's the brightness, the luminosity and the happiness. And it's as if at the edges of that happiness and brightness, at the edges of, there's like a whole little pack of little terrier dogs sort of <laughs> yapping away. And it's not that they're in the middle causing mayhem or really loud, but you can just sort of, you're just aware of them there. You s are you in the jhana, are you out of the jhana? It's an irrelevant question. In, out, it, it's... Where's the intelligence here? Well, the question is, what do I need to do at that point? What needs to happen? Um, one of the things, wh what do I need to pay attention to? I, I, let's say, here's this luminous happiness right there. Here's these little terriers yapping. I'm just going to get more, I'm just going to really get into that uh, happiness and luminous, open my body to it, open my mind to it. We'll talk about all this. Now, it might be that in doing that, the, 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 the terriers nicely quiet down and fall asleep or, or whatever, but it might be they stay there, and actually, that's as good as it's going to get right now. Okay, so I've got, I've got this really nice, lovely, yummy, juicy happiness, which the 
the person who gave their right arm for the PT would now give their left arm as well for it. And don't, don't worry, the terriers are there, it's not a problem. Just get into it and enjoy it. And, and don't worry about this in and out business, okay? It's just how, how not to consume the mind with questions that are not relevant. But also, sometimes it's the terriers are yapping, da -da -da, I'm kind of into it, but let me go to the terriers, see what they need, and see if I can do something that encourages them to do something else. Okay, so it's not like there's always a formula, but one formula is it's, it's okay. This is the deal right now. This is as good as it's going to get. Um, ma make sense? Yeah. So sometimes there's hindrances in different forms. Sometimes a hindrance arises. It's just, is it a hindrance? No, it's just that the energy body, it's not that my mind is consumed with this or that. It's just that the energy body feels a little constricted or blocked. I'm not, I'm not obsessed with this. I'm not thinking about that. I'm not lost in desire or doubt or any of that. It just feels a little bit blocked. So we could call that a subtle hindrance, if you want. Um, or it's just that the energy body kind of won't settle down or the chitta won't really settle down. It's not even from gross distraction or thought. It's just there's something like, like a just a little agitated in the energy of the chitta or the body. So that's a bit like the yapping terriers. Or, or sometimes, and again, this is something that may be for some of you, or will be for some of you later, may be relevant for some of you now. Sometimes it's amazing. If you have, if you have quite a lot of experience in and out of jhana, sometimes it's just like, it's almost like you can just dive underneath something. So here is this, it's blocked or it doesn't feel right, something's not settled, and like I said, it's a bit like the radio frequencies or the wardrobe. The jhanas are there anyway, and you can kind of just point the mind to a level that's actually really peaceful. Now, it might not be pristinely, wonderfully, radiantly, uh, you know, overwhelmingly peaceful, but there's something that you recognize, like, well, that's the kind of peace that belongs to the third jhana, let's say. I recognize that peacefulness. And... And and you point mine, you just dive underneath a little bit. It's there, and th and then I'm I'm tuning to that. Okay, I'm not getting caught up. Yes, this part of the body doesn't feel quite connected or bit feels a bit constricted, or the mind's not so. I'm just pointing to that. I dive into it, and then and then what's my work there? I've dived in. Now I'm in in touch with that peacefulness. Now what? Now I I, I need to work with that, get into it, enjoy it, open to it, focus on it, etc. We'll talk about more of that. Um, so it's not really that the jhana is quite there, but something of a doorway to that, something of a, a trail of that jhana is there, and you can pick it up and, and just kind of point the mind there and dive into it with, with, with practice, with time. Um, so there is, and then once you, once you get that trail or opening, then you work on staying there and stabilizing and absorbing into that, etc. So... Um <coughs> As I said, with jhana practice, we really want this attitude of working with, working against, if you like, uh, the, 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 the hindrances. We really want this idea of antidote, but we also really want this idea of patience. So there's a back, I'm patient while I'm working with. Yeah, it's really important. Um, I'm playing with and experimenting with uh, all that. And I can use all my ingenuity and creativity in how I relate to hindrances or what might, what might help. And at the same time, I have a firm resolve. I'm not just going to give up now. I'm not just going to get up and walk away or just sit through it and say, oh, whatever, who cares? Um, so there's this combination of working actively, of being creative and inge ingenious, and a firm resolve and patience all together. So it's not that we want to get kind of locked into a grim battle for hours on end with some hindrance or another. At a certain point, you know, it's like, all right, you win the battle. You're not going to win the war, but you win this battle. I'm going for a walk or I'm going for a cup of tea or something. Part of that is also just uh, taking the pressure off and opening the mind. You know, if I go for a walk, it's like um, the beauty, the, the air, the light, the, the spaciousness. I hope by the end of this retreat that everyone n knows the beauty of rain because you get a lot of practice with that. There's no reason that bad or so-called bad weather shouldn't should affect your sense of beauty. But um, so, in a way, kind of what we're doing is w the emphasis is more on cultivating well-being than kind of fighting the hindrances. It's just we're doing both, but it's like it's, it's a certain way of thinking about it that's that's the balance. And again, to those of you, or when those when when you have um, more and more experience, if you've got um, 
after you've got quite a lot of experience in and out of different jhanas, you sometimes just get a sense um, of what's possible in, in any moment. So maybe I'm working on the fourth jhana is where my playground is, but it's, there's hindrances around wh whatever. It's just, and I'm kind of stuck in the first or second jhana. You just get a sense, no, I can stay with this and shape it, and it, and it, will, it will go deeper. And other times you get a sense, it's, this is as good as it's going to get right now. You just have a feel for it after a while. That takes that takes practice. So still, that's great. You know, that's really good. Um, just the fact that it, there's a subtle hindrance blocking you from getting as far as you've got before. No problem. You you, you take what you can get, um, what's accessible, and you, you kind of develop a sense of. You know, I don't know what an analogy would be. Or what's possible in any in any particular situation. All right. To finish, some things about insight in relation to the hindrances. Um, so one thing I've already said, the hindrances are spectra. They're not on-off. There's, there's, there, there's a spectrum for each hindrance in terms of really, really gross, more and more, more and more subtle. Um, so that's partly just like, I know that, I understand. That's the territory that I'm dealing with. Partly, um, that has a couple of implications. One is that, uh, what I've already said, they will be common visitors. They will be com they will be coming and going. If I have the view that they shouldn't be or they won't be, or after a certain amount of practice or once I've reached X jhana, it it won't happen, that's the opposite of insight. That's delusion. Okay. So there's there's just a certain amount of insight in recognizing um their spectra and that means in one form or another, in one uh, uh, one level spec on the spectrum of grossness or subtlety, they they will be coming. So I'm aware of that. Um, second thing is, it's not linear, okay? So yes, they'll be coming and going, and they'll be coming and going even after you reach whatever jhana, you know, um, in terms of what's part of your practice. You might... Um, I, in other words, how to say this? Uh, you could have a much harder time with the hindrances later on in the retreat than you did earlier, or something. There's no, um, or you feel like now I've got to this jhana. Now it was going so well, and then suddenly, suddenly I'm just in a hell realm, or whatever. So, if if I've said this before in many other talks, but if someone comes into me and they're doing samadhi practice and they just describe this kind of smooth smooth ascent day by day into the Tushita heavens, kind of uninterrupted linear graph like that. Either they're lying or they're, again, really not paying attention. It's more like this. Okay, there's a trend, yeah, but it's more like this. Actually, it's more like, we'll, we'll explain. But it's, it's not linear. So we, we, again, have to, just because, I'll come back to this in a minute, just because we had a great time for the last five days and all this stuff was opening up, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to fall down a hole into the hindrances uh, tomorrow, or that they will not visit, let's say that. Third piece about uh, insight here is um, we want to m help ourselves to get to a relationship with the hindrances where we're really not taking them personally. Okay, They are aspects of being human. Um, until, apparently, one is an arahant, um, and that means fully enlightened. They're, they're aspects of being human. Taking personally, what I mean by that is, oh, I'm a bad meditator, or this means I'm a, even worse, a bad person because I keep getting this or that hindrance, I keep getting aversion, or I keep getting desire, I'm really greedy, or I'm this or that. Hindrance is, is don't take it personally, it's a human thing. It just, it, they're like, um, facts of being human and they don't th the arising of a hindrance doesn't mean anything about my cap capability as a meditator or 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 my you know uh, worthiness as a human being yeah that's really really important so um can i encourage that attitude and that's kind of that's part of what we want to move towards and that's part of the gift of jhana practice is that we c we begin after a while to see it's not personal. 
but we want to really encourage that, not taking it personally. The second thing, again, we want to move towards, uh, this is the fourth insight piece now, is that we more and more believe the stories that the hindrances spin less and less. So less and less d over time do we believe uh, the stories that the hindrances spin. So what happens is a hindrance arises and we get convinced about that it's actually about this person, that, th that they are the problem. It's not the problem of my hindrance. It's about them. Or it spins a story about me. Um, and then and oftentimes then it spins this whole papancha thing. Yeah, that whole proliferation. Actually, what's happening is a, a seed of a hindrance arose, which is what happens for human beings, is hindrance seeds just keep coming up, defilement seeds, kilesa seeds, greed, aversion, delusion, in one form or another, manifest as the hindrances. They're little seeds. And then what, without wisdom and mindfulness, those seeds become huge, huge trees, forests, jungles, jungles better. Um, we want to get in there and kind of not what allows them partly what allows them to become jungle is is not is believing sorry partly what allows them to become a jungle those seeds is is believing them believing what they tell us believing the perceptions believing the stories that they spin getting tired now is this making sense yeah this is so crucial as i said if nothing else happened on the retreat you didn't have an a millisecond of an ounce of a nice feeling, but that's what happened on the retreat. It, that's really, really good. Um, that, that would make a huge difference in your life. Huge difference. And, and the fifth uh, insight piece is that we, we get to view them as, in relation to what I just said, we actually view the hindrances. Yeah, they're really unpleasant, but in a way they're kind of like gold dust or gold ore. There's something really precious here. I just need to find the right relationship with it. I can turn it into treasure if I find the right relationship with it in terms of view and wisdom. So they're really like gold dust, like something unrefined and f filled with all kinds of not so great stuff. But actually, there's a treasure there. Because as I said, hindrances will come up in life. It's not just something in meditation we think about. What about that creative project? What about that service project? What about your work? What about coming up in long-term relationship? Or same, same things arise, the same hindrances arise, and they, they will get in the way of, they will hinder. Nivarana is the Pali. It's literally what it means. Something that's an obstacle gets in the way of a, a going forward. Um, they will do that in all of those other realms of our life. It's not just something about meditation. If I can get wise to them, if I can learn, learn how to view them in a way that they lose their power, they might still arise as seeds, but they lose their power. And that's absolutely huge and absolutely precious. And it, part of that is it also, it, I begin to understand something about emotions as well. And this is really interesting that Something that seemed like it's this emotion that I'm feeling. I actually see, oh, sometimes it's actually just a seed of a hindrance. And I, the mind has spun that into a story and a certain emotion has arisen. But actually in its root, it was just this hindrance or mostly this hindrance, sometimes. So there's something about understanding the hindrances that is actually really important in understanding our emotional life. I'm going to come back to that in a sec. Um, but, but the fact that there's spectra, there's a there's a range. The fact that um, well, let's say this: the fact that there's spectra um, is part of this development of subtlety. Because I, I, I recognize they're going to get more subtle. I have to, my attention has to get more subtle to even pick up on subtle hindrances and then work with them. So when we talked yesterday about how I would say it's so important, this development of subtlety and refinement and discrimination, that also happens in regard to the hindrances. So there's, in terms of our overall kind of trajectory, this... Um, working with recognition and working with the, the, the subtlety of the spectrum of a hindrance is also part of that whole development of subtlety. Yes, it's much nicer attuning and discerning to 
subtle differences of this kind of exquisite peacefulness versus that kind of exquisite peacefulness. But in terms of developing the whole subtlety, again, which is so important for our emotional life and all the rest of it, that, that's important too. It's all subtlety. It's all discrimination. It's all attunement. In terms of not taking hindrances personally and not believing them, can you hear that? That's about letting go. That's about having insight into what they are. I see you, what, what you are, and I let go. I'm no longer dragged along by this story or this identification. There's a letting go, it's insight. Yeah. Last thing. If you do enough of jhana practice, what you will begin to notice is what seems like a kind of backlash. It's as if it's going really well and maybe even a new territory opens up. I got into a new, a, new, a new opening or a new state or a new wonderful thing happened and I'm in that for a little while, however long that little while is, half a day, three days or whatever it is, a few hours even, and then all hell breaks loose. And, and sometimes it can seem like, it's almost like the very opening caused a kind of backlash, that there was a kind of reaction to it somehow. So this is a, it, it's some, I wouldn't, it's not like every time kind of expect it, so, uh, you know, but it's, there seems to be something like that. It seems to be. And it raises a lot of questions. I mean, again, we need to expect it, etc. Don't take it personally. It's not linear, all that. But I wonder, is there some kind of catharsis, some kind of purification going on here? So I know people um, who have exactly that view, that what we're doing in jhana practice is somehow allowing a kind of uh, karmic purification of our, sankar our sankaras and our emotions. Some people have that view. Uh, I would be a little more cautious, so I don't want to rule that out, but I, I, I would rather take both views, yes and no. Um, again, if I step back from that, what we want is a range uh, Remember this thing I said, I want you to have a range. Do you remember me saying that? I want you to have a range in regard to your emotions. Um, we want this range with regard in relationship to our emotions and, and with regard to the ways of working and the ways of viewing emotion. I would like you to have a really big range. I can work with emotions in lots of different ways. I can view emotions in lots of different ways. Um, and I, and I have a, a whole range of emotions as well. But um, if there's a lot of jhana practice, um, and and if we're allowing that jhana practice you know, over a long time, I mean, and if we're allowing that jhana practice to, to give rise to insight, we will begin more and more to recognize the fabricated nature of emotions. So to an emotion is a real thing. It arises by itself. It's there. And it's just sort of, I have to deal with that because it's a truth. Over time, we may or may not get more into this, and I know it's a sensitive term, we b it becomes almost undeniable that an emotion is a fabrication. Without me doing something, usually unconsciously, it cannot arise as that emotion. It cannot get fabricated. It cannot get constructed. So in the Buddha's words, we see a hindrance as a hindrance and not necessarily as an emotion. We recognize what's there. It's a fabrication, or in other language, it's actually empty. An emotion is empty. But if you remember back to the first night, I said, I can see an emotion as empty, and I can see it as real. I'm not parking in either one. I have the possibility to shift between views. This, to me, this is absolutely crucial. Most, most often people park in either one, and that's, that becomes their view. For me, it would be catastrophic and tragic to only ever have the view that emo emotions are, always have the view that emotions are fabrications. I would never want to only have that view. But both views become available, and therefore the view of catharsis, the view of, yes, something is purifying here, I may not even know what, but I sit through it as a purification, and then I have a whole stance with that and relationship with it. Or the view that it, it's not that, they're, they're fabrications, and I need to get interested in the fabrication, they're both there. But as we practice certainly jhanas more and more, we begin to see a hindrance as a hindrance more and more, uh, as the Buddha might say. And what happens, as we said, is 
there, so it's not linear in terms, it's very up and down, but there is a movement over a long time with jhana practice that what, m what might manifest more as papancha, like really extreme agitation and lostness in story and believing everything and self-view and all that, actually begins to manifest less as papancha and more as, more as just pure hindrance. So over time, there's this kind of, um, what would you call it? sifting away, filtering away of the more pa punchizing element of the mind. And it becomes, it's just the hindrance. I mean, but it's still be quite a strong, I'm really quite restless in the body, but there's no story got attached to it. There's no lostness. So what was usually pa pancha becomes more just, I'm just dealing with the hindrance now. And then over time, even the hindrances themselves become, m they tend to become m more and more, they tend to be on the subtle side of things, but they're still there. So there is, over a long time of jhana practice, there is this movement of, of shaving away the, the gross, uh, getting down to the hindrance, and then <coughs> even more subtle. But, um, but they stay. They're part of the deal. And we need to be okay with that, really up for that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um... I was going to take some questions, but I think we already had a couple, and I think it's probably enough now. So let's, um, let's just sit for a minute together. And Thank you, everyone. Um, enjoy tea. Enjoy your evening practice. And I think there are a few interviews this evening. So just if you haven't checked already, just check that uh, that's not you. Um, and see you tomorrow. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.